everybody. Let's do it. Block party's out. I'm your host, Mike Wall. Thanks for watching. If you're enjoying, hit that subscribe button, like, rate, and review us on our YouTube channel, Process to Perform Me, and hit me up, Mike Wall 68. Find us on the Believe Network if you want to listen to the audio version, although you'll be missing out on film study like we will be doing today on some linebackers. Our, our show, as always, is sponsored by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports. List lost my page. Summer sports this seasons from Major League Baseball, golf the NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. For those that are interested, I didn't see uh, on that line that use your promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-A-V to your 50% welcome bonus. I'm going to go ahead and put it out there and say there is it is still there, but I really don't know. Thanks for our sponsors at always, as always. So here's the deal. Just got done, I think, with the men's NCAA basketball tournament. And uh, I think the NBA is still going. The NBA is just tough, man. I, don't even, I, I know it's still going. I know we got some Champions League soccer today. But really, April, when you think about, like, when's the start of the football season, it happens this – this is the start of the football season because – most guys start matriculating back into their. I got to change the camera. I can't stand looking at the uh, at myself. It's uh, it's it's as my wife would tell you, it's terrible. But April's the start of the season because, um, guys start matriculating back into the 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 building and new teams, new coaching staffs are going to going over their core values and, you know, to their new the veteran players. And everyone's kind of like, okay, have I heard this before? Is this new? There's always this new speech, but I hate, by the way, I'm sure it's good for fans, but I hate that new coaching staffs have to put their opening speech to the players on social media. Now I saw Raheem Morris, who I have a ton of respect for, and I'm sure it's not his first choice to do, but you put that out there for the Atlanta Falcons. He goes out and he has to put it on social media. And I just go, man, that like, that's supposed to be our time, you know? It's like Spicoli and Mr. Han. That's our time, Mr. Han. I don't want to share that time with everybody else. But um, as a former player and coach, I think one of the odd things in the National Football League, and, and this wasn't necessarily – you got to remember in the, back when I was playing for Green Bay, at least, we didn't have off-season workouts. So this never happened in, in Wisconsin. But, you know, they bring these this top 30 picks in. And so, you know, you see guys now, especially when I was working down in Miami, but this even happened when I was in, in, in Seattle and Carolina – you see guys coming in for these draft visits that are there to take your job or somebody's job, like one of your buddy's jobs. And it's just, it's odd. I will say this, you can get a lot out of that. I remember, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to shame him, but I remember that a high profile running back came to Miami and he would not open the door for anybody else. It was just one of those things where you're like, it just had, it was just like so classless. And I just thought to myself, I, I hope, I hope the little things do matter when they're when they're evaluating these guys. But they come out, they wine and dine them. Um, I think teams can get a lot of a lot out of that visit in terms of understanding who they might be picking up. And so, but let me. I just want to take you guys like kind of pull the curtain back a little bit on what can happen, what I've seen happen, and then what also happens. So, so half the teams in the league, or let's say twenty teams in the league, are gonna are going to either a try to show that player how advanced they are compared to everybody else because they're probably not like in the top six, seven, eight teams in the National Football League. So they're going to show you their every single department, every single department's going to have a spiel. It's just, it's on and on and on. Instead of what I think is ideal is, and I, I know this is what a lot of the, the more accomplished teams, more comfortable teams or comfortable staffs do, is they bring these guys in they sit them with the position coach, the coordinator, like the guys that are going to spend the most time with. And they sit and they just start talking. And they talk about anything and everything. They go on long walks. They'll go onto the field and take a look around and just talk. Just do what are you about? Like what, what gets you up in the morning? What makes you excited about this game? And then they turn on the tape. They'll turn on the tape of their college tape. They'll turn on the tape of, of the, the team that they're, they're visiting. They'll turn on the tape of divisional opponents. They'll want to know information or how they see a certain player on another team, how they see the player on their team. But you just try to get this sense of like, how desperate is this dude to be really, really good? And I think when teams start asking those questions and start of, instead of showing them how special like 
the training room is, or that they have a sports psychologist, and that their nutritionist is certified by 12 different certification methods. Like that stuff is not unimportant, but as far as that, the player's going to get drafted one way or another. What I want to know is on a non rehearsed answer level, what can I find out about that person that is going to give me the feeling that I've got the next Luke Keekley in the building, or I have somebody who, you know, runs like, you know, looks like Tarzan plays like Jake. So I think that's really hard. Um, well, it's not, I don't think it's hard at all. I should rephrase that. I think there's roadblocks in the way to make that difficult. One, the agents have the, tell those guys to rehearse every answer that they can think of um, in interviews, obviously at the NFL combine. And then, and then here uh, at these, at these top 30 visits. And then two, everybody wants to play with the shiny new toy being this new player and they want to show them around. They want to show, and everybody's got a job justification thing in the back of their head going, what I do is so important. I had a, there was a Pilates lady that was in Miami and she did a great job. But I remember she sat there one day and, and was like telling us that she was the reason the team was winning games. And I thought that might be a stretch. I don't know. I mean, very, very important. Certainly the most important thing, like the reason we're winning games, not part of the reason, but the reason, not so, right? And so people get that way, especially when you get somebody new around because the new guy is going to be good with the owner or the president or, you know, the higher ups. And so if they like you, you're going to stick around. And that's kind of how the game works, unfortunately. Um, looking specifically now at, at the draft and how it pertains to the Green Bay Packers. There are a lot of questions about the linebacker position on the Green Bay Packers, right? Devondre Campbell's not part of them. Hayfley decided, and I think Goody, everybody said, okay, Devondre Campbell experiment, man, great the first year, tough last two years. Obviously, the way it, the, the way that he ended it, again, I don't necessarily think that anything he said was inaccurate. I do think that it was probably not the way that I would have tried to handle my business, but so it is. Now we've got former first-rounder Quay Walker. I think he's going into his third year out of Georgia, and – a BC standout playing for Jeff Hayfley at BC, Isaiah McDuffie. Um, you got them penciled in at the, as the starters. Now, everybody knows that I love Isaiah McDuffie. Everybody knows that I think Quay Walker is a super talented guy who's just, you know, quite frankly, we're going to talk about a little right now. I just don't think he's put, been put in the right position. That could be a combination of the defense they run, the coaches that he had, and the fact that Devondre was hurt, especially last season. Um I'm going to sit here and make the argument, though, that a starting caliber linebacker is necessary to be in this draft. I feel like they need to pick or free agent trade, whatever we want to talk about. But you need to bring another starting guy in, at least a starting caliber player into that room. And I'm not going to say that Wilson's not that guy. Well, I'm going to say that Wilson might not be that guy right now. But I, I, I say this, the in, in the NFL, the pendulum swings all the time. So you remember back in the day when I was playing, Ted Washington was 400 pounds, Tractor Trailer was 365 pounds. That's playing defensive tackle. Aaron Donald plays defensive tackle now, right? 265 pounds by some measures, 295 pounds on the high end. He just retired, but you see how we go from big, immovable, to small, leverage, strong, explosive pass rusher, okay? The guys, offensive linemen, they went from 295, 330, 315, you kind of start going back and forth as far as where things settle. The pendulum swinging right now in the National Football League. You're seeing a lot more because of the success of all the Shanahan offenses. 21 personnel, adding fullbacks back into the mix. 12 personnel, 13 personnel, with one or two of those guys actually being tight ends that can block. Okay? So the groupings, the personnel groupings are changing, and that means that every team is going to have to at least think about having – what am I going to do with that in, in a 4-3 defense and a single safety defense? Do I want to have a third linebacker that can do everything? Or do I want to put a third safety on the field that's maybe a little bit thicker guy, maybe doesn't have the same range, but I'm going to call him a safety. I'm going to drop him down in the box or put him near the line of scrimmage. And that's how I'm going to play defense as opposed to putting in like a 240, 245 pound guy. Back in the day, if you would have put a third safety in, we would have laughed our ass off as we, as Amon ran for six or seven yards of carry, but that's just not the way of the world anymore. When Quay Walker was coming out of Georgia, remember back when he was pre-drafted when he was drafted, think about what was being said and, and all the, like, what could they do with Quay Walker? 
Okay. He was so athletic. I think he weighs 240 pounds. He's like six foot three, six foot four. I mean, but he's got, he's just got wingspan. He's got range. He's got everything. He's got the range of a safety. He's got the speed of a guy that can play in the slot. He's got the speed of a guy that can play zone out there on the third receiver. You can put him on the edge. He reminds me more of a Derek Brooks, Will Linebacker, a Junior Seau, kind of somebody you move all over the field, a Jesse Armstead. Those kind of rangy guys may be more so than a guy that, unfortunately, for the last couple of years has just smack dab in the middle trying to take off centers and guards more often than not. He's super athletic. Put him in space. And that's exactly what NFL defenses, presumably this new system, are desperate. Like, that's the question you need to answer. Do I have that unique guy that could kind of take all these different roles and I can do he can do it by himself? And I think you have that with Quay Walker, but you've been putting him at Mike Linebacker, and he's not, he's not a I'm going to go smash the center and shed a block and make a, and make a play at the line of scrimmage kind of guy. He's just not that kind of guy. Isaiah McDuffie's that kind of guy. He's not the athlete that Quay Walker is, but if you want that guy, he's already on the roster. You can, you can have that. Now, can you find another one or one that's slightly more physically capable uh, to round out this room? That's a big deal. Someone or defense, a coordinator that doesn't need to switch out that guy when the offense goes from like 21 to 13. That's a big deal with like two receiving tight ends on the field now and they can match up. It changes the way you can call defenses. And for me, the other part of it is this gets Quay out of the middle of the defense. It gives him more opportunities to attack the line of scrimmage from the edge, right? He can go up against linebackers, fullbacks. He can go up against uh, sometimes these backside tackles and tight ends. It's not what I say, linebackers and fullbacks, tight ends and fullbacks. Jesus. I think that's something that elevates his game. And I think it's something that when you look at Isaiah McDuffie, who I do think is a starter on this football team, I've said it a, a billion times, you put him in the middle, what he naturally does extremely well, extremely well, is attack the line of scrimmage. So you need to find that complementary piece that can allow Quay to go do Quay things, which I think there's this unlocked potential there that we just haven't seen yet. You see flashes of it when they put him on blitzes, dogs, when they put him on pressure looks, when they put him on run, like some run stunts. He is dynamic. He's a playmaker. But when you have him sit back, he's not the kind of guy that just attacks line or attacks centers and guards really well, sheds box and makes plays unless they're eight yards down the field. Now, here's the problem. There just aren't that kind of dudes in, in, the, in the draft anymore. I mean, speed kills in the National Football League. So I think like my opinion is. The guys that are looking at these linebackers are looking at their 40 times, their, their splits, their third card, their three cone shuttles. They're looking at all that stuff and they're not paying attention to like what, in my opinion, really matters the most, which is can this guy do the things in the box that make him a great, great linebacker? Um, I remember I, I've told the story before. I'm going to say it real quick. Nick Barnett got drafted at Oregon State. Nick's, Nick's from SoCal, right where I'm from. Nick's a badass dude, okay? But when Nick got drafted, we, he was like 228 coming out. And, and we went upstairs to Sherm, or we saw Sherm, and we're like, are you out of your mind? This kid's going to get murdered. Because Nardo Harris was 250 when I came in, right? Uh, shoot, Hardy Nickerson was 240, 230, 238. I mean, it, we didn't have – you don't play with small dudes. Jeremiah Trotter was 265. Levon Kirkland was 290. I mean, so we're used to seeing these monsters in there. And then you bring this 228-pound kid. We're going, this is going to be a real problem. Now, Nick got learned how to play. He put on some weight, by the way. But he learned how to utilize what he had, power explosiveness. You know, he's a very, very smart player. But it's tough. And so I had to cut the herd when I look at this because, I mean, there's a lot of guys talking about Edger and Cooper at linebacker um, for the Green Bay Packers. And, like, I – Without here's what here's all I'll say. You watch a handful of film and you go, good athlete, can't get off a block. And so I had to cut the herd somehow. Here's how I did it. Criteria was potential fits over 230 pounds, runs under a 465. So like there's not a lot of like four three guys, four four guys in there. Okay, so there's a lot of four five, four six guys. Um 
And I had to cut the herd somewhere, so I just made it at 230 pounds because Nick was at 228. And I'm telling you, this kind of breaks my heart because Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is in this draft out of Clemson. And just on name and pedigree alone, I'm drafting that dude if I'm the Green Bay Packers. I don't know if he's a first-round pick, but if he's around like day two or day three, I'm picking up Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Because if the worst thing happens, Jeremiah Trotter walks into their room one day and everyone goes, Oh, that's what it, that's what a real dude looks like. Because that guy was an absolute unit. One of my favorite opponents to play against, man. When you hit him, you felt it for like three days. It was awesome. Um, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is actually slightly undersized. It wasn't that he was too slow for this criteria. He was actually too small, which is nuts. So here are the guys I checked out. Let's just go through this real quick. First guy, Junior Colson out of Michigan. Okay. 6'2", 238. I think I got some more stats up here. 89 tackles, two passes defended, zero force fumbles, zero interceptions. National championship player, obviously. 4.5840 yard. And no other stats. I couldn't find any stats from his pro day or went up. Not really sure why. Maybe it's not out yet. Let's check this guy out, though. So my initial thoughts just... As you're looking at these guys, number one for me is like, it, can he move or not? Is it because the further you get away from the line of scrimmage, the better you mover you have to be. This guy is a, a fast twitch player and he's a good mover. We're just kind of looking at the way he, he, he can flip his hips around. He just looks like, he just like to me, he just looks twitchy, right? Apparently he was so fast in that play, I missed him. Now, here's what I don't like he does not, he's not good at block pro. Right. And it just seems like there's a nut. This is another scenario where um, another college kid is coming in who, who can't, is not really good at block destruction. So he just tries to, he just kind of takes this block. Now he can run down these players because he's fast, but this is not what you're looking for as far as hand placement. Obviously, that turns into maybe a, a tackle at the line of scrimmage if you do it right to a tackle five, six yards down the field you had to help out on. Now, this is a different scenario because you got to think about are the RPOs, bubble screens, everything that's going on in the league. So I'm not going to just say sit here and say this is an easy play for him to make, right? They have him outside the tackle box or at the tackle a little bit because they're looking at this, this uh, trips look out here and the way they've got this bunch formation, this kind of inverted bunch. You see how the backs are lined up with the quarterback in shotgun. One's offset, one's, one's ahead of the quarterback, one's behind. But we look at the linemen and their blocks here. We're coming off and you just never want to get pushed back. Like you have to have a, a block destruction plan of it's, you know, shuffle stand, you know, same foot, same shoulder stab. If it's going to double swipe the hands, but you can't get knocked back right with two hands in your chest and then have to react off that. Not a good look. So we got the pull, we got the kick out on the end, the double teams coming up to our guy Colson here. Does such a good job, again, Twitchy, does such a good job of just going underneath this last minute, defeating that block and making a play. Probably the best play I saw him make on film, just from a straight, like, guys coming at him, got rid of, got rid of the guy quick, right? Got went underneath, didn't try to mess around with him, dipped. You see he plays with good body height, body position, and leverage. Love it. Now we see the receiver coming down and hitting him. And this pisses me off, right? If I'm if I'm trying to draft this guy, it's like, why don't you get your hands on the receiver? And why do you let him get on you for that long? And I know maybe you guys are saying that wasn't that long, but do like he's hitting him with his shoulder when you should be like, you're the you're the 238 pound linebacker. Like jack that dude in the chest and, and he's gone. Like that guy, in my world, that guy doesn't exist. When he comes down like that, trying to stock block me, and I'm 238 pounds and I'm a Michigan linebacker, that guy doesn't exist in my world. So that's the way he needs to think about it. He needs to get a little bit better technically from that standpoint. He's got the good vision here. So he sees the vision on the RPO. So he gets. You know, a lot of people say, oh, he got shook by this tight end. Like, there's a lot going on that we have to look through. It's not that he's staring at the tight end. It's staring at the mesh at the, at the quarterback. His eyes got to go to that tight end. Tight end shakes him, but the recovery speed was great. So the recovery speed at the end of that is, is really, really good. So we're not just going to look at, because that's coaching, right? Like, where do I where do my eyes need to go, et cetera. But if that 
tight end hits it just right, he's going to get the step on you right there. That's the point of the that's the point of running the RPO. Field speed is like he's every bit as fast as you need. He's going to get to that deep middle if you need to run a cover two look. Um, he's just got range. You see how easily he flips his hips. Really, really like the way this guy plays. Now, you got a two-way go here, and sometimes this linebacker, you got to respect your own speed, right? So he tries to go underneath here, and he does a good job of not letting this, this uh, I think this is the backside guard, getting get a, a piece of him. But you got to go ahead. If you're going to go underneath, as everybody knows, got to make the play. Okay. I like him. My verdict is this. I think the upside of Colson is, is worth taking a hard look at. Again, you have the same problem that you have with Quay in that he's not really good at block destruction. You want to put him in the middle. That could be a problem. This guy right here, Peyton Wilson, NC State, 6'4", 233, tackling machine. 138 tackles this year, one forced fumble, six sacks. Now, this dude is fast, 4-4-3, a 1.54 split, former, I think, state champ wrestler, and athleticism jumps off the screen. Why is he not a, 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 a surefire first pick? He blew out his knee twice, once his uh, senior year in high school, once his freshman year at, at uh, NC State. But you wouldn't know it. Now, maybe if you start digging into his like vertical jump, maybe it's you know 34 instead of 38 or something like that, but you wouldn't know it watching him play. So double team, tough shed in. Love it. Against no, this is I, I picked a tough, a tough tape, right? You know, I just go random with the plays, but I picked the Notre Dame tape for a reason. Love the play speed. Here he's out on the wing. We get the quarterback draw. And just everything looks effortless from him from a running standpoint. We already saw him take on blocks. Now he's chasing down. Got to make this play, but the ability to cover. So they were actually running a game. They're running a stunt here. He calls it off when the, when the back leaves and has to chase him down and makes this guy cut back now you want to make the tackle but the fact that he can hawk him down with leverage and make him cut back within three yards of the line of scrimmage again play speed play speed play speed both these guys have exhibited play speed ends up getting in on the tackle now unfortunately here's what we see again we saw him do a really good job defeating the double team with the two linemen now he's got a tight end pulling on i want to see a collision here like you've got to have these reads you pop out and this has got to be like you got to create here. We got to we got to be the guy. Same foot, same shoulder. I want to stand thirteen up in the hole and close this thing down a little bit. Thirteen gets the best of him a couple times in this tape. Now we put him on the line of scrimmage. This is another player that I think is is as dynamic as you're going to find in the college football ranks right now. Where you can like Quay, you can do a lot of different things with this guy. Put him outside. They pulled Joe Walt, the, who's going to be, I think he's the Outland Trophy winner. He's going to be the uh, first pick in the draft from a tackle standpoint, offensive line standpoint. Now, this play is supposed to go inside. He gets bounced out. So Joe Walt, does, or, or the, you know, the tackle's not doing anything wrong. But he does do a good job of, of smacking him and standing him up. Ends up finishing this play at the line of scrimmage for a tackle. Now, this is an NFL play. And I bring that up because he's going to see this every day in training camp. He's going to see this every game until he fixes the problem. Man, that can't happen. When you come around, you can't just get wiped out by the tight end. And I'm going to play this one again because I think it's important to see. The reads here, when you're a linebacker, the reads are obvious. When you see these guys blocking down and you've been watching tape, you know exactly who's coming to hit you. So you got to get your feet set and not get driven off the ball. I love the upside of this guy. More so than Colson. I think they're both good athletes. I think this guy's elite. He's got six sacks. Had the forced fumble. I didn't know. I didn't look at the picks. 138. I mean, the guy's just a tackling machine. There is an injury injury deal there, but he really, really looks talented. Again, coaching's going to make a big difference. Last player. 
I went, I was watching Notre Dame. He's probably eighth or ninth on like, you know, the expert list. Okay. But they include edge guys. Marist, uh, Liu Fowl. I hope I said that right. Respect to you. University of Notre Dame, 6'2", 234 pounds, just clears it. Uh, I didn't get a lot of stats on him. He didn't have a lot of numbers. 44 tackles, three sacks, one forced fumble. Here's what I can just pull out immediately. Comfortable in coverage and can play with bend. I put can in there because I think it's important when you watch. And the other thing. Four six four forty yard dash isn't great, but sixteen reps on the bench. Like I saw that, and I went, I know receivers that beat sixteen reps on the bench. So something's there's got to be a story behind that. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I had a buddy, John Morandi, who played center at Notre Dame. We both went to Rim of the World High School. I went to the academy. John gets um, John gets old man Lou Holtz to come to the school and recruit him. He's such a big time deal, right? We go to Lake Havasu at like the end of our sophomore or junior years. We're out partying, having a good time for spring break or summer. I can't remember. All the guys got back from high school. We're all hanging out. And John and I had been lifting together. And I was I was never as strong as he was until I got to college. And John's over there telling me how, because they were trying to recruit our strength coach, Phil Emery, who ended up being the general manager of the Bears. And John's telling me how they got him running cross country all the time. And now it's all starting to make sense. Maybe we got the same guy doing this year because 16 reps on the bench. I'm pretty sure I can still do that. And I'm old as hell with a bad shoulder. Let's check this guy out either way. First of all, real jealous of the haircut, as you can probably imagine. Handsome dude. Good in space. They line him up all over the field. He, he's the guy that goes out and plays man coverage on the, on, on the running back. We'll see here. Just put it on there. I don't know if there's anything of note except for the fact that they don't mind him being out there playing man. Really good timing in, in pass coverage. He's a really good rangy player. Now they walk him up here to be the, the tip of the spear when you're talking about this bunch formation or this diamond formation. Does a good job of attacking and staying with it. Fight through. Ends up making the play. Now, we just call this beating the scheme, okay? And... I don't know, some of you might show this on tape and go, oh, this guy did such a great job. Notre Dame knows this play is coming, right? Because he's already sitting up two yards off the line of scrimmage. They haven't done anything yet. They're going to pull. They're going to run the read. He's going to keep it, tracks him down, makes a good tackle, right? Love it, love it, love it. Still got to make the play, though, right, guys? Look at the range. I don't like how he bounces off here. You know, Obviously, you want to have some awareness. I think he does a good job here of identifying the double crossers, getting behind the second one. As soon as he sees the first one, he looks behind him, sees the second one, backs up into him so he doesn't have that the quarterback doesn't have that throwing lane. Just a subtle thing, really good job. I don't know why, I don't know if it, if it's the only reason it forced the pick, but it was certainly a part of it. Get involved, get involved, and this is my best hit of the tape unfortunately for this guy. Watch this. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Love the body position here. And this is why I say he can play with Ben. He's a tall guy, but he can play low. You see it right here. Not, not a big part of the play, but you want to know that the guy can sit in the box and take on and take on offensive linemen. You have to be able to play with a little Ben to you. Now we're worked up here. We use them on the rush. They run like that, that little E linebacker game comes around, defeats the running back. Sticks with the play. Obviously, he's getting the secondary move on that sack. But, again, they use him in different spots and spaces so you can kind of project in the National Football League the different things you can do with him. I see this as another guy where I, he's big enough, at least with a little bit of work. And, you know, listen, he's got to get at least 10 pounds bigger in the chest. Quite frankly, he's got to take on NFL guards. But then he looks like the kind of frame that can develop into a, a, a linebacker that plays in the middle of the field. You got to get around here. You can't get pinned. And you see it. You got to see it. You got to go. And you got to have an answer for the guard who or the tackle who's inevitably trying to wall you off. And this is maybe what I saw a little bit too much of when I watched this guy's tape. Custom 3D. No idea what that means. I'll put it back up. So, 
I think the bottom line for me, I really, really like the NC State kid, but injuries are a part of his story. I like the upside of, of the Michigan Colson. I, I think he's I think he's going to be a good pro. Um, I don't really know how to value because I don't really care. Uh, I don't know how to value the 25th pick in the draft when it comes to linebackers. I'll just say this. From a just purely from a value standpoint, I would say the NC State kid is as valuable to me as those three centers that I picked up: Zach Frazier, John Power, Jackson Powers Johnson, and uh, and uh, Graham from Duke. Barton Graham, is that right? Graham Barton, Barton Graham. Those three guys, I think, are twenty fifth pick worthy. Maybe one of them is higher than the other. I think the NC State kid's 25 pick worthy. And again, I don't I don't really know what that means. It just means I think he might be available. And if he was, I, I would be interested in taking him. Um, but I don't know that the other guys aren't until day two or day three. And that doesn't mean that they can't come in and contribute. I just think, you know, I always think of like the first pick, maybe your second pick is like a really, really coveted pick. And you have to, like you got to nail that one and they got to they show up and play immediately, especially that first pick in the draft. So, that's where I'm at. I want to go to listener questions before I get out of here because I had some good ones today. Uh, since Brett Good is retired, the Packers have had issues replacing long snapper. How significant is the position? Why do you believe – okay, why do you – lack of success to find a replacement? I don't know why because it doesn't seem like – it just seems like one of those things where if you're a smart dad you're, and your kid's like kind of athletic but not really, you go, hey, learn how to long snap. You can play for 20 years in the National Football League. Nobody ever does that because it's not romantic, but it's super smart. Um, it is an important position. Because like Rob Davis was our guy for years, and you just you like probably nobody knew who he was because he doesn't make mistakes. So having a good one is invaluable. Certainly, when you have problems, is the only time you notice it. Uh, it for me, it's just it's not quite as hard as kicking the ball through. But I mean, snapping the ball on a cold day, or rainy, and it's punt or or field goal, and it's like a critical game. The guy, the holder, and the snapper are super important to me. Who do you think is the best middle linebacker in this class that fits the Packers? I think I just showed you the NC State kid. They're not going to pick him probably at that pick because of the double ACLs. But for me, size, speed, athleticism, everything like ability to take on a block needs a little bit of work. But you did see some, you did see some uh, sunshine there, so I do like that. Um, how do you feel about going into the year with Quay and McDuffie a linebacker? I'm not upset about it. I do think they need uh, they need the third guy for the reasons I stated. Now going to a four three defense, I believe we use the, the ability of lose the ability of Gary and Smith, the outside linebacker, pass rush. I'm not well. The assumption, of course, is that they're just. And I've said this for years, like you should put your hand in the ground anyways for most of these guys. Um, I would say the majority, Van Ness for sure, of our draft picks recently should be would be a much better off at, at the outside linebacker position with their hand in the ground because they're going to play with better leverage, get off the ball faster. That's just me. So I got no problem with what that is going to add to their game. I think the same – Rashawn Gary, I think he's going to be better with a hand in the ground, quite frankly, if they, if, they, if they force him to do it. I could be wrong. But I, I can guarantee he's going to get off the ball faster. Um, does that put us in more nickel looks versus base 4-3? No. It, it's, again, really what it comes down to is who that safety is versus who that um, who that linebacker is, what we just talked about. If you make Quay that guy, well, then you can do whatever you want, right? And conversely, uh, Xavier McKinney, like we think he's going to be the post safety because that's what Haefeli talked about. But he played star at Bama, and he could very easily do that again. So he could be that guy. Um, he's maybe a little bit you – know, for me, he's undersized at that point. He's like 198 pounds. But he could be that guy as well. I mean, if that's the way you want to run your system. I did the thing on Junior Colson. Um, with most linebackers in college only seeing a pro-style offense once a year, do you think of the learning curve for the new age linebackers? I One of the steepest in position. I, we'll finish with that one. Absolute, I absolutely do. You know, it's funny. I think offensive line and linebacker are bastardized in college to the point where it almost feels like scouts and people are looking at the position and projecting based on like numbers. And that's it. it I, linebacker in particular, because some of these guys, like what are the basic tenets of like playing linebacker? Well, getting off blocks, making tackles, then pa like pass coverage for me to be, would be third. And now it's one, one A and one B. And then the other two are two and three. So I don't – we talk about the range. Like we did this when Quay came in. You talk about the range of Quay Walker, but you don't talk about the fact that he's he, it, it coming into 
the NFL from Georgia, he wasn't the best player at taking on a block. So he was making a ton of blocks, eight yards down the line, off the line of scrimmage. Like nobody talks about that until it starts affecting your team because, oh, they're just enamored with, oh, he's got such range. He's so fast. But the basic tenets of the positional requirements of the sport, I'm not sure that we're very good at those anymore. It's certainly not the level we were maybe 20, 30 years ago. I think the same thing about the offensive line position, maybe for different reasons. The offenses that we run in college, a lot, you know, they want to, they want to, First of all, they don't have the headsets. They want to get it out fast. They want to make it as simple as possible because they want to they want to use tempo to disrupt the defense, maybe more so than kind of some elaborate system and schemes. For no other reason, then they can't signal it in because they don't have headsets, which is asinine because high school and Provo. So they're sandwiched between headsets, no headsets. Makes no sense. I think they're going to change it. But a lot of this is all predicated on how do we create the simplest expression of telling those guys what to do. And then let everybody else kind of have their information. How can we do that in as, as efficient way as possible so we can just get more reps on all the timing throws and all the thing, all the looks that we want and not have to like coach up the offensive line. And so you see a lot of guys coming in with bad technique, with bad football IQ, or it's just areas of opportunity. So I always look at it. You can look at it like I can sit here and shit on the, the younger generation. That's not really what I'm doing. What I'm really saying is, if you get drafted by a team with a good coach, you're going to be a lot better than your buddies that got drafted by teams with bad coaches that didn't develop them. So, or if you go find a guy outside of football that really knows a lot about your position and can really help you improve, you're going to be a lot better off. You're going to make a lot more money. You're going to have more success than the guys who just stick around and learn what they're learning at the, at, at, in the building. So these all are things that are opportunities for the people that look at it as such. That makes sense. Uh, areas of opportunity. I just put it up because it was so important. All right, guys, that's the show for the week. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy. Again, thanks you to the Believe Network for uh, hosting this show. Thank you to Bet Online for sponsoring us. I am going to be back next week. I don't know what we're going to look at. If you guys got ideas, let me know. Hit me up, Mike Wall sixty eight on Twitter. Process to perform on Instagram. Check out the YouTube page. Process to perform for the Block Party Podcast. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week.